Okay, go ahead and open up your Bibles to the book of Isaiah. You're going to find that almost right in the middle of your Bible. Continue our study through the Old Testament here, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. It's been two weeks. Last week we had our apologetic speaker. And um, Terry, did you, did you go to that event over the weekend? Is that good stuff? Great. You did. Great. Um, yeah, just Terry and I were talking when that apologetics group comes through the Somes County Apologetic Forum. They when we bring in when they bring in the guest speaker from out of town, we're the first stop on Wednesday evening. And then they get around to some other local churches through the weekend and generally put on some kind of conference or class or something on that Saturday. And so if, you know, there's something that happens, you know, something that really rings your bell that Wednesday night, just know that you can follow up with different events. And there's normally different um, offerings at the different, some area churches from here to Arlington. Um, So anyways, uh, so Keith Reed, one of our elders, he was teaching us through Isaiah. The last time we were here, we're looking at chapters 11 and chapters 12, when we saw how Jesus was the fulfillment of what we read in, in chapter 11, we, you know, we read that, that passage of, you know, chapter 11, verse 1, the shoot will spring forth from Jesse and the branch from his roots will bear fruit. We saw this shoot as Jesus it was the fulfillment and said, verse 2, that the spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and the strength, and the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And he will delight in fear of the Lord and will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make decisions by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. So Jesus says fulfillment of that. And then we looked at, you know, the, in chapter 12 there was a call to praise and to give thanks Chapter 12, verse 1, then you will say on that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. And just the beautiful little uh, passage there about giving thanks and praise to God. As we get to chapter 13, we're going to switch gears a little bit here. Basically, from chapter 13 to chapter 23, we're going to turn the corner from prophecy and judgment against Israel or against the house of the Lord or the house of Jacob. There's different ways that this is expressed. And it's going um, to turn to judgments against nations that are against Israel. So if you remember, so far there's been a lot of judgments or you know prophecy against Israel and the warnings against Israel and how they had were departing from, you know, wholeheartedly following God. If you remember, uh, this is the time, this is a prophet, Isaiah. He's in the time of second Kings. So this is uh, the, remember Isaiah is in the category of prophecy. And then he was a prophet during, what we would read about the historical references in second Kings. So if you kind of read, you want to read the background of the time of Isaiah, you would look at second Kings and you'd see that's where the prophet Isaiah was at that time when he was given these prophetic uh, words. And remember that the kingdom of Israel divide, was divided into two uh, kingdoms. You have the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah. And so Isaiah was a prophet to the land of Judah. And the warning was that Israel had fallen. Israel had already been taken out because they fell into idolatry and they weren't wholeheartedly follow, following God. And Judah was right at the line that they were about to also fall and be taken out. And so this was a warning to Judah. And then we see that, you know, what's real interesting about Isaiah is that Isaiah's prophetic words, they're pretty wild where they have this near and far uh, prophetic fulfillments where we'll see that there is prophecies fulfilled in Isaiah's day or around the time of Isaiah. But then there's also these far-reaching prophecies that speak to end times or way ahead in the future events. And they'll be in the same, the same prophecy. So it's near and far. Some call it a, a double reference. Um, it, it's kind of amazing 
to see it. And so what we're going to see as we turn the corner here, chapter 13 through chapter 23, it's going to be these judgments against these other nations that are surrounding Israel. And remember that God was going to use these outside nations to bring judgment against Israel, but then he was going to use Israel to bring salvation to the nations. This is fascinating thing how God works these out. Um, so what we're going to see, the first judgment is going to be against Babylon. And uh, the words against Babylon, they're interesting because at the time Isaiah writes this, Babylon wasn't really a world power. You know, often we think of Babylon when we uh, reflect on it or think about it, it, it's some, you know, magnificent city with, with great power. At the time of Isaiah's writing, it wasn't a world dominating power. It hadn't risen. It was only, it was going to be about a hundred years later. So it's kind of interesting how Isaiah is prophesying there. So it's God speaking through the prophet. This is how God would speak in the Old Testament. He would speak through the prophets and then the prophets would uh, bring this word. And so um, here, let's read chapter 13, verse one. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah, the son of Amos saw. Lift up a standard on the bare hill, raise your voice to them, wave the hand that they may enter the doors of the nobles. I have commanded my consecrated ones. I have even called my mighty warriors, my proudly exalting ones to execute my anger. A sound of tumult on the mountains like that of many people, a sound of uproar of kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts is mustering the army for battle. They're coming from a far country. From the far farthest horizon, the Lord and his instruments of indignation to destroy the whole land. So this was the word that Isaiah was bringing, that there was an oracle concerning Babylon. Anybody have a different word in their translation besides oracle in verse 1? Pronouncement. There's another word out there. Huh? Is that yours says prophecy? Yeah. Some translations say a burden. Yeah, burden. Yeah. So this was this, you know, a word that Isaiah was given, this burden that he held, a prophecy, a pronouncement, an oracle, that, that it was going to be a judgment that was going to come from God against physical Babylon. And we're going to see this in the chapters ahead. There's going to be other oracles or burdens or prophecies against other nations. And it's interesting, you know, I said physical Babylon because in the Bible, Babylon is referenced many, many times, and, and not just as a city. In fact, in the Bible, Babylon represents a physical city. It represents a religious system. It represents a political system, an economical system. We see this come up actually in the book of Revelation. We spent some time on that in our study in Revelation. And, and other than Jerusalem, Babylon is the most recorded city throughout the Bible. 280 times, over 280 times Babylon's mentioned. And uh, we actually read in Revelation 17, I have this for the screen, that uh, Babylon is called the mother of all harlots. Revelation 7, 17, 5, and on her forehead name was written a mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And this is, when we read Revelation 17, this is the fall of Babylon at that time. And Harlotry has the idea of idolatry, it's betrayal. And abomination is the idea of hatred and disgust towards the Lord and rebellion to his authority and to his kingdom. So at the core of all things Babylon is rejection of God, his rejection of his kingdom, rejection of his sovereignty, rejection of his people. In fact, all things Babylon oppresses God's people in all ways, whether it's a city, a nation, economical system, a political system, a religious system, it oppresses God's people and is opposed to God. And the, the, the powers behind Babylon, when we read throughout the Bible, it's demonic. It's Satan. 
In fact, um, the origins of Babylon, it comes from uh, Genesis chapter 10. I see, you can turn there. I got a little note here. I'm feeling like we're going to run out of time. I may shorten up my deal here. Let's see. We'll see what happens here. In, in Genesis, actually 11, we have Babel, which is Babylon. In Genesis 10, we're introduced to Nimrod, who is the leader of Babel, Babylon. And we see an interesting thing that happens here. And you, you might be, this might be drawing familiar uh, memories here. Chapter 11, the whole earth, I'm in Genesis 11, the whole earth used the same language and the same word, and it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. They used bricks for stone and they used tar for mortar, and they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the son, sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, there are one people and they have the same language. And this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Just come, let us go down there and confuse their language so they will not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad and from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from the Lord's scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. So there is the origins of Babylon, and we're going to touch a little bit more on that as we get into chapter 14. And we're going to see that Satan is behind all things Babylon. And there is a demonic forces associated with Babylon. So Babylon, the oppressor city and nation was that oppressed Israel is taken out by God. Look at the, go back to Isaiah 13. And by the way, we're going to, I'll touch on this in a minute. I'm kind of, I'm looking at the clock thinking I need to figure something out because it's not going <laughs> to, where I'm going, it's not going to fit. <laughs> but Babylon's a real place right now. You guys understand this. Like Babylon is in Iraq. It's a city, a real city. The ruins are still there. And that's going to be interesting because, because in the, in the um, pronouncement against Babylon, it's destroyed and it says it'll never be inhabited again. It is in ruins to this day. Man, I don't know where I... I either just shut it down right now, or we go late. Um, it's going to mess up our teaching schedule. We have a little schedule with the, the boys here. Let's... Let's look, go to Isaiah 14. I want, I want you to see something. This will go with it here. Um, here. Isaiah 14, 24. Here's, here's an interesting statement that's made. Now, this is a judgment against Assyria. But, but I want you to see something here. It says, the Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, surely just as I have intended it, so it has happened. And just as I have planned, so it will stand. So to break Assyria in my land, and I will trample him on my mountains, then this yoke will be removed from them and his burden removed from their shoulder. This is the plan devised against the whole earth, and this is the hand that has stretched against all the nations. For, verse 27, the, for the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And as for his stretched out hand, who can turn it back? I've been chewing on this for a couple of weeks right now, thinking about 
if the Lord said it, he's going to do it. And if the Lord planned it, no one can frustrate his plans. And so I was thinking about this Babylon, this judgment against Babylon. And in fact, it says, um, go, go back to 13 verse 17. Behold, I am going to stir up the Medes against them who will not value silver or take pleasure in gold and their bows will, will mow down the young men. They will not even have compassion on the fruit of the womb, nor will their eye pity children. And Babylon, the beauty of kingdoms, the glory of Chaldeans pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Hey, Chris. Google an image of modern day Babylon and you'll see there's like this picture of ruins. And and when you find that, you can just put it up. And Babylon, the beauty, verse 19, and the kingdoms, the glory of the Chaldeans pride will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It will never be inhabited or lived in from generation to generation, nor will the Arab pitch his tent there, nor will The shepherds make their flocks lie down there, but desert creatures will lie down there and their houses will be full of owls. Ostriches also will live there. Shaggy goats will frolic there. (laughs) Isn't that the funniest thing? Isn't the Bible great? There's going to be shaggy goats frolicking in the ruins of your city. Hyenas will howl in their fortified towers and jackals in their luxurious palaces. Her fateful time also will soon come and her days will not be prolonged. Did you find a picture? I mean, there's a lot of similar ones. Hopefully you're thinking what I'm thinking. Uh, Yeah, no problem. Um, So here is the pronouncement. This is the oracle concerning Babylon which was not of great power of the time. Again, this is like a hundred years before it really comes to power. And, and Nebuchadnezzar and all these guys, they, they, dominate the, um, they dominate that whole region there. It becomes a, a superpower. And then about 200 years after this time, we read in Daniel chapter 5 that King Darius of the Medes comes and takes out Babylon. That's a good one. What do you think? There's Babylon the Great. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. No Arab will pitch his tent. This is modern day Babylon. You can go and visit the ruins of Babylon. Modern day Babylon. No one lives there. This they talked about the hanging gardens of Babylon. It was like the seventh wonder, one of the seven wonders of the world. Um, eighth wonder. Yeah. And so what I was thinking about is that being said, God saying this, and then what he says in chapter 14 The Lord of hosts, verse 24, has sworn, saying, Surely, just as I've intended it, so it'll happen. Just as I have planned it, so it will stand. Verse 27, For the Lord of hosts has planned, and who can frustrate it? And so thinking about the world events, we trust in a sovereign God. We trust in a God that's in control. We trust in a God that's working things out. And it, and it is so often above our understanding and our comprehension. You know, we, we really view things in, you know, very um, subjectively, right? We think about our context and we think about how it affects our lives and, and we view things in through what we know. And we have a hard time understanding, you know, what, God, what are you doing? But we may not understand it, but we can trust him because this word stands. This word stands. And these prophetic words have come to pass. It's amazing.
I want to touch on, you notice I skipped a, a section here in Isaiah 13. There is um, from verse 6 to verse 16, judgment of the day of the Lord. So it's interesting, Isaiah, Isaiah kind of weaves in and out of this near and far thing. So he's talking about in, in the first part of 13 and the last part of 13, the destruction of the near Babylon, the physical city Babylon. And then he strays into this far prophecy of the end times. Check this out. Verse 6, so chapter 13, verse 6. Wail for the day of the Lord is near. It'll come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp and every man's heart will melt away. They will be terrified. Pains and anguishes will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel and fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation and he will exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. Thus, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for the their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place. And at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger, and it will be that like a hunted gazelle or like a sheep with none to gather them, they will each turn to his own people and each one flee to his, his own land. Anyone who is found will be thrust through. Anyone who is captured will be fall by the sword. Their little ones also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. What does this make you think of? Huh? Israel, but I'm thinking like in time tribulation stuff. Look, look at Revelation. Look at, go to Revelation uh, chapter 6. Last book of the Bible there, Revelation chapter 6. At the breaking of the seals, there's that, that whole section we get into that kicks off the, that great and terrible day of the Lord, that tribulation time, that seven-year period, And, and in re, in the, as the last seal is broken, Revelation 6, verse 12, it says, I looked when he broke the sixth seal and there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair and the whole moon became like blood and the stars of the sky fell into the earth as a fig tree cast its unripe figs. They're shaken by a great wind. The sky was split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and, and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come. Who is able to stand? So like what we read in Isaiah 13, great earthquakes, the sun turns black. There's, you know, suggesting a, a solar eclipse, the moon turns blood red, suggesting a lunar eclipse, stars fall from the sky to the earth. You know, when you put all these things together, some scientists suggest some, uh, some kind of asteroid event. Um, some have suggested maybe a, a nuclear event. Um, you know, they hide themselves in caves, it's interesting when we looked at this in Revelation, you know, there, there is in Colorado a massive cave that's a base called NORAD, and it's a bunker to withstand, you know, a, like a 30 megaton nuclear blast within a mile or two of it. And so, you know, could that be the cave that men hide themselves in uh, at this time? I don't know. The truth is, though, if God has said it, it's going to happen. 
And so as Isaiah prophecies of it, prophesies of it, we see it in Revelation, this tribulation event is going to happen. The last seven year period of time in, um, you know, and I, and I believe though, you know, as, and I've said this when we went through this in the book of Revelation, you, you don't want to be on the earth at this time, at this time. And, and I don't believe that the Christian is going to be on the earth. I think the Christian is going to be taken up um, because this is a wrath poured out on a Christ rejecting world. You know, in Isaiah 13, 11, we read that he, he said that thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I'll put an end to the arrogance and the proud and base the haughtiness of the ruthless. Look with me over at Thessalonians. I'll, I'll end with this. First Thessalonians chapter five. I don't believe that we're destined for this wrath. This is the thing that's going to happen. The great tribulation is God's wrath poured out on a Christ rejecting world. But I don't believe that we are destined for this. And there's a word in Thessalonians that's an encouragement for us. If you find first Thessalonians chapter five, Paul talks about the, the day of the Lord and, and the context of this judgment that's coming. And he says in chapter five, verse one, now as to the times and the epochs, brethren, you, you have no need of anything to be written to you for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they're saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them. And then suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, they will not escape. But you brethren are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief for you are all sons of light and sons of day. You know, it's interesting, you know, as we look at the events in our world today, I don't know how many times I've said in the last couple of weeks, wars and rumors of wars. And it's pointing me back to what Jesus said in Matthew that was going to happen in the last days. And so here he says, you're, you're not in the darkness. You're going to know. Verse five, for you're all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of night nor of darkness. Verse six, so then let us not sleep as others do. Let us not be, let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep, do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and the helmet, the hope of salvation. Listen, here it is. Verse nine. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. So whether we are awake or asleep, we'll live together with him. Therefore, he says, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. And so the Christian is not destined for this great, terrible day. I believe he's going to be taking us out of here. Uh, look at chapter four. I feel like I just have the fire hose on right now and I'm just like. <laughs> I hope you can't sleep tonight. I hope you're just thinking about this. Like, I got to know more. I got to read more. In chapter four, he says, in verse 15, for this we say to you that the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, verse 16, will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. We shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So two times, Talking about these end times event, Paul says, comfort one another with these words, encourage one another with these words, build up one another with these words. And so we get this whole idea of the rapture from this caught up thing. And I'm not going to go through that right now. That's a whole nother series. But if we're looking at the timeline of world events, according to the book of Revelation, there's going to be a point where Jesus shows up in the clouds. It's not his second coming. He's not touching down. He's going to show up in the clouds. He's going to give a shout. Hey, church. Come up here. And we're going to be with the Lord. And then that's going to start the clock of this seven-year tribulation time. There's two distinct three-and-a-half-year periods of time. There's going to be a rise of the Antichrist. It's going to be all the things we read about in Revelation from chapter 6 to chapter 19. God's wrath is going to be poured out on the Christ-rejecting world. But we 
as it says here, are not destined for that wrath. And we're to encourage each other with these things. Listen, we are to put on, and I love this right here. This is, this is the encouragement. Verse 8, chapter 5, verse 8. First Thessalonians 5, 8. Let, let's leave with this. Since we are of the day, let us be sober. So he's not, he's not talking about being free from alcohol right here. He's talking about alertness, which <laughs> would be free from alcohol. But he's talking about, even in a, in a spiritual sense, being alert, eyes open, aware of what's going on in the world, and the thing around you. Be of sober, and then this is what he says. Having put on the breastplate of faith. Imagine this. The breastplate, it protects your vital organs. So your, your faith, your faith, your faith in God's word, your faith that if he said it, he's going to do it. If he planned it, it's going to stand. Your faith that if we have confessed Jesus as Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we are saved. Faith that when Jesus says that I go to prepare a place for you, that where I may be, you may be as well. Faith that when Jesus says, you're in my father's hands, you're in my hands. Whoever the father has put in my hands, I'm not going to let go. Faith protects you, your vital organs. Then he says, love. Love. So faith and love, this protects you. You're putting on Christ's love. And then he says, and as a helmet, what does the helmet protect? Your brain, your thoughts. Your mind as a helmet. What? The hope of salvation. Faith, love, and hope. So we live in a world that is devoid of hope. And there's so much hopelessness. You know, you wonder how does the, someone get along with joy in this world? It's only by hope. The hope of salvation. Man, this is a good word. We need this in the world we live in today. And, and so the, he says, put on, put it on. You know, I was talking to my kids this morning about our little devotional this morning. Talked about um, putting on, thing, from Colossians, about putting on. And, and Aaron wasn't really getting it. He, he was kind of being stubborn. And I said, we're at the table. I said, well, you're not naked. What? I wouldn't come down here naked. I'm like, you got dressed, right? Yeah. How'd you get dressed? It's like, I put on my clothes. Put it on, man. Put on your faith. Put on your love. Put on the hope. Don't be naked. You with me? Okay. I did not do what I wanted to do tonight. That's okay. We'll figure the rest of it out. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for this word. Thank you for, I just love that encouragement, Lord. You, your, your plan stands. If you've willed it, you're going to do it. You're a man of your word. Thank you for the, the, the hope of salvation. Lord God, would that hope protect our minds and our thoughts? Lord, thank you for the gift of faith and the gift of your love, would that protect our hearts and our beings, who we are? God, would we wrap our families with faith, love, and hope? God, I pray that you would make up for my deficiencies tonight if I've left things out or unex didn't explain things well. God, I pray by your spirit you would make sense of those things in our minds and our hearts, and you'd meet us in our personal times of reading and our prayer times. Thank you again for this gathering and the prayers earlier. God, we ask for your blessing and the filling and the leading of your Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen.